So let me ask you, what is the world's fastest animal? And how does that speed compare to the world's fastest human? And Usain Bolt has reached world record speeds of 28 miles per hour. Uh, underwater, we see the world's fastest animal is a sailfish, which can actually reach 68 miles per hour. What you might have guessed is the world's fastest animal is, of course, the cheetah, which can reach blistering speeds of 75 miles per hour. But the world's fastest animal, the world's fastest recorded speed ever, is actually a bird. It is the peregrine falcon. Now, the peregrine falcon can reach speeds of 242 miles per hour. That is a couple miles faster than the fastest Indy car, around 240 miles per hour. So how or when do we see the peregrine fal falcon reach this blistering speed of 242 miles per hour? So what they actually do is something called a hunting stoop. They fly super high at high altitudes and they look down with a bird's eye view of their prey. So they might be hunting pigeons or other birds or other rodents. So when they get to that bird's eye view and they finally locate their prey, they do what's called a free dive, a hunting stoop. And when they do this is when we see them reach blistering speeds of 242 miles per hour. So one of the cool things about physics is that we can apply mechanical principles of different species, different organisms, different objects. So what we can do is study the peregrine falcon and how does it reach these maximum speeds of 242 miles per hour. And we can apply that to the human. So something I'm interested in is sport biomechanics, sport mechanics. So what are the mechanical principles that explain why a peregrine falcon can reach such high speeds? And how can we mimic that in sports? How can we use those principles for athletes to maximize their velocity. Um, one of the key components, the key mechanical principles that I'll focus on today is something called drag force, okay? So what is drag force? It's a resistance force that is caused by the motion of an object through a fluid. And let's break that down further. So when we say the resistance force, try to think of that as like a friction force. If it's cold outside and there's ice on the ground, uh, to maximize friction, we will have a snow boot with a rough, ridged, treaded surface on the bottom. And what that allows me to do is to minimize my velocity by maximizing my friction force. On the flip side of that, when an ice skater wants to go fast on the ice, we have to minimize the friction force. So what an ice skater will wear is a boot with a thin, long, cylindrical uh, surface, which would allow the skater to glide at high speeds on the ice. So if we think of drag force similar to friction force, in this case, the drag force is an object. It can be a peregrine falcon. It can be you, a human body, moving through fluids. Fluids can be air or water. So these terms we often associate with drag force are air resistance and water resistance. Okay, there's two types of drag that we're going to talk about. Um, two types of drag. We have surface drag. And this is often also called skin friction drag. So this is a resistance force caused by the friction of a fluid between our skin, the surface of our skin, and the air or water. So as we run through air, if we have a headwind or a current, how that air molecules or water molecules interact with our skin surface. The other type of drag is called form drag, and for this we think of shape. So the shape of the object. What we'll see is that to maximize velocity, we need to minimize drag. So how do we do that? We want to have a nice, smooth surface. To, if we have a nice, smooth surface, we minimize surface drag. So you can imagine air molecules will fly over the surface in a nice, smooth, laminar fashion, and that'll maximize our velocity. On the other side, with surface drag, is we want to mimic 
this teardrop shape, and it's called a streamlined body. Okay, so a streamlined body allows the air molecules or the water molecules to travel over the object and maximize our velocity and minimize our drag. Next, we want to look at the drag force equation. So if we look at these variables, that'll help us understand how we can minimize drag, maximize our velocity, and how the Peregrine Falcon takes advantage of this relationship to maximize its velocity. So what you're going to see with this drag force equation is it's this big, intimidating looking equation. So we're just going to break it down piece by piece. Okay. So what we can do is look at each variable that is in this equation. And if we lower that, that will lower our drag force. So that is kind of the simple part of it. Everything we see in this drag force equation, we want to lower and that'll lower our drag forces. So what is in this drag force equation? So the first thing is the density of the fluid. So we have the density of the fluid and what we're talking about is air and water. Amazingly, air is 830 times less dense than water. So what does that mean? It is much easier to travel through air. We can travel at much higher speeds when we're traveling through air than when we're traveling through water. So for example, Usain Bolt, the world's fastest human, can reach speeds of 28 miles per hour. If you look at in the water, Michael Phelps, the world's fastest swimmer, he can only reach a top speed of six miles per hour. The world's fastest jet, 2,100 miles per hour, versus the world's fastest submarine, 51 miles per hour. Uh, the other thing with air density that we can try to kind of control is altitude. So at higher altitudes, the air is less dense, meaning it is easier to travel through the air, and thus you can travel at higher velocities. One of the reasons the Peregrine Falcon can travel at such high velocity is it is going to be at a higher altitude. If we think of a sport example, we can think of the 1968 Olympic Games. Okay, these took place in Mexico City. Mexico City is 1.5 miles high. We think of Denver often with altitude, that's a mile high. Mexico City is even higher, 1.5 mile high. When we had the 1968 Olympic Games, we saw world records in the 100 meter dash, the 200 meter dash, the 400 meter dash, high jump, long jump, triple jump. Okay, so why did we see these world records? Because at that high altitude, it was easier to travel through the air, thus allowing the athletes to reach higher velocities. Another part of our big intimidating equation is what's called relative velocity. This is the velocity between the object, could be you or the bird, moving versus the velocity of the air, okay? Simply put, we can lower the relative velocity, then we can lower the drag. And where do we see the lowest velocities? We see the lowest velocities, the lowest relative velocities, when we have a tailwind or a current behind us. We're going to see the highest relative velocities when we have a headwind coming at us or swimming against a current. How can we manipulate this? Uh, the only example really is um, at uh, the Olympics also, we see long jumpers, high jumpers, pole vaulters. They get a minute and a half to complete their trial. So what do they do if there's a headwind? They stand at the starting position and they hope in a minute or a minute and a half that that headwind will die down. If 30 seconds in or a minute in that headwind dies down, then they will start their motion to do their high jump or long jump. Okay, next in our big intimidating equation, we have cross-sectional area. Okay, so another term for this is frontal area. So if you've ever been crazy enough to skydive, what you will see is that they skydive, they look like this, right? They're maximizing their cross-sectional area by putting their arms out and their legs out in this fully maximized area um, trying to take up as much space as they can. What you'll see is uh, elite skydivers, or even more insane, might kind of try to take this streamlined position, which will minimize cross-sectional area. 
Uh, one of the amazing things of the peregrine falcon is the maximum velocity is not when it's flapping its wings and it's not when the wings are out here. The peregrine falcon will be flapping its wings and then when it wants to get to that world record speed to that dive, it will tuck its wings in, okay? So it tucks its wings in, minimizes the cross-sectional frontal area of the body, thus minimizing drag, maximizing velocity. We see this also if you've ever been skiing for the first time as beginners, you're probably pretty upright, right? Because you don't want to go down that hill at high speeds. It's terrifying. Uh, versus elite skiers are going to be in that nice crouched position. Nice crouched position, streamlined position, which minimizes the drag force, maximizing the velocity. All right, one more part of the equation. We have what is called the drag coefficient. This is kind of a number that we assign based off the shape of an object. Um, this is going to be the key component of that form drag, okay? So the shape of an object will tell us how fast it is and how it can minimize that drag. What we do in sports is we do everything we can to mimic that streamlined body to minimize that drag force. And again, this is going to be kind of this teardrop-shaped position or object is where we see the lowest drag coefficient. And some of the numbers with a streamlined object, you're going to see a drag coefficient as low as 0.04. If you compare that to the largest drag coefficient, you're going to be upwards of 1, and that's going to be kind of like a big square box type shape. Fascinating what we see with the, the peregrine falcon is when we see the minimum drag coefficient, the minimum um, shape or form drag, and the maximum velocity, it's actually in this kind of weird cupped wing position. Okay, so it has this cupped wing position and it allows airflow to travel through it the easiest way, the minimum drag, maximal velocity. One of the cool GIFs, hopefully, maybe you've seen it, is, um, that we can exhibit this relationship with a cyclist is in a cycling race, we have this image of the guy who is pedaling and he's in last place. So what does he do to shoot up to first place is he stops pedaling and he gets into this streamlined Superman position on his bike. And when he gets into that streamlined Superman position on his bike, he flies by all the other cyclists. Okay, so that again is taking advantage of that, that relationship. Okay, so if we try to think of other sports and how this applies, think of a cyclist. Have you ever wondered why cyclists wear that kind of goofy looking tight lycra bodysuit? Um, again, that's going to be to minimize skin drag, surface drag, okay? So that tight suit, skin tight suit, will minimize the drag that is experienced when air travels over our skin. So what happens when air travels over our skin is it can get into the pores. We have hair that kind of blocks the air and can increase the drag force and slow us down. With cyclists as well, we can look at how thin the bike is. If you ever see race cyclist bikes, super thin, tires super thin. You can also look at the aerodynamics of the helmet. It looks like that teardrop streamlined object. Another sport we can apply this to is ski jumping. So ski jumping is a fun sport to watch. They travel in that streamlined position down the hill and then when they take off, they try to get streamlined like the peregrine falcon as much as they possibly can. They do have big long skis that get that in the way so they can't be completely flat, but they're imitating, mimicking that position as much as humanly possible. Uh, one other fun fact about the, that applies this relationship of drag is at the 2008 Beijing Olympics, Speedo came out with this laser racer swimsuit. Okay, this was a skin tight swimsuit that formed to your body. I think it took the swimmers 20 minutes or so to get into this suit. What did this do? This reduced skin friction forces by 24%. Now normally, what do swimmers do to try to minimize skin friction forces? Well, they shave all their hair off and maybe they lotion down their body before they get in the water. 
This suit uh, was able to reduce skin friction drag by 24% more than when swimmers shave their whole body, okay? So what happened at the 2008 Beijing Olympics is all these swimmers wore this bodysuit, 23 world records were broken. Okay, so what, it found, what they found is obviously this suit was providing too much of an advantage. And it was just kind of a joke that that many world records were being broke, so they eventually banned the bodysuit. You're not allowed to wear the bodysuit at the Olympics anymore. As an example, when we engineered our understanding of drag uh, a little bit too much. Uh, just a couple other sports I'll throw out there. Crazy sports such as luge or skeleton. So if you ever see luge or skeleton at the Winter Olympics, you'll see them reach incredible speeds, again, by mimicking, doing everything they can to minimize skin surface drag and form drag and mimicking that peregrine falcon. Uh, last example, speed skater, same thing. They have a full body suit even up to their head and helmet, and that helps minimize the drag. So with today's talk, I just hope you can see the fascinating ways that we can apply mechanical principles, physics, of animals to a human, and you can do it to objects, cars as well. In sport, we can apply it to a baseball, discus, etc. Thank you.